Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Katie Flynn, Content Director at SavingForCollege.com. And in just a minute, you'll be hearing from Joe Messenger, founder and CEO of Capstone College Planning. At Capstone, Joe teaches a program called the College Pre-Approval Process to financial advisors, and this provides a practical step-by-step -step approach on how to help clients prepare for college and also ensure that their, their kids graduate with manageable student loan debt. Joe is passionate about helping families prepare for college and keeping their kids out of debt as he aims to inspire other financial advisors to learn how to do college funding the right way. Um, and as part of SavingForCollege.com's new partnership with Capstone, they are offering you a special discount on their training coursework. Joe is going to give you more details on that, but we feel their products is a great complement to the tools we offer on SavingForCollege.com. We know that affording college is the number one concern among today's parents, and so by combining our focus on saving and Capstone's late-stage college funding training, we can really help you become experts in this area and help you provide added value to your clients. Um, so if you have any questions during the presentation, please enter them into the question box on the right side of the screen, and we're going to do our best to answer all of them within the hour. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Joe. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm just uh, going to get my slides pulled up here. Um, and hopefully everybody will see this here in a second. So if you can just confirm there, just make sure we're, we're looking good um, and sounding good. I think we, we are. So I'll go ahead and get started. And yeah, really excited just to uh, kind of formalize what we've done together, respect the work, obviously, of SavingForCollege.com. Uh, they've been at it a long time and uh, definitely been a resource for me. Um, and as Katie said, you know, I think we kind of just come at it from some different angles uh, and kind of who we serve and how we serve them. So uh, we'll go ahead and dig right in. So. I wanted to, first of all, you know, as we're going through, uh, just give you some context. Um, why am I in a position to talk about this? Um, we, uh, I, I'm also the co-founder of Capstone Wealth Partners. So I am a financial planner um, and work with families uh, day to day. So it's still in the trenches, so to speak. And we've been doing this for nearly a decade, uh, focused specifically on financial planning for college bound families. So I bring that up because I think the nuance is we're not just college planners. We are a comprehensive financial planning firm. Uh, I'm a certified financial planner. We're an independent fee only firm. We act as fiduciaries over all affairs. And really our solution and what we coach for advisors is to take a holistic approach um, and to ignore college funding, not just saving for college, but actually helping pay less for college is the key. So, but like I said, we do take this in context of a full financial plan. So. You know, really to create the right solution, it's college, not just for one student, but for the whole family. Uh, is, are they on track for retirement? What are the trade-offs they may need to make to make college more affordable? And how do they invest, you know, to make this all work? You know, obviously, savingforcollege.com and the 529 resources and tools there uh, is the predominant way. But, you know, there's lots of ways to make sure this works and our assets positioned in the right type of vehicle uh, to get them where they need to be in a comprehensive context. So <clears throat> as we've done this over the years, People began to ask, uh, and we've been asked, and we've we've appeared in some different publications. Uh, we were a lead article in the Journal of Financial Planning. We've been in a number of the advisor magazines as well as consumers. Um, so uh, we decided to formalize um, because we feel like our message is bigger. Uh, so really, you know, our goal at Capstone College Partners is to end the student loan crisis one family at a time. And we and to do that, we need to raise the bar on college funding advice across the industry. Um, myself included, uh, before I really delved into this over a decade ago, we're never really trained on how uh, financial aid works and how to actually pay for college eloquently, the late stages of college funding. Uh, many of us are trained right when we come on board on what a 529 is, some of the mechanics and how it works, and tools like savingforcollege.com can help you uh, up your game there. But the reality is um, college funding advice goes much beyond just saving for it. That's a unique strategy to pay for it. So. So what we aim to do is empower financial advisors across the country with a process called college pre-approval. Um, and as you'll see, hopefully, as we go through today, I think there's a lot of folks that talk about the problem, uh, but they don't really offer really sound solutions of how to actually approach this um, and, and work with families in a, in a good way to help them solve this problem. Um, so it's not just about the education so that you know what's going on, but it's also about uh, delivering good advice in this area and how to connect with people uh, and how to stand out as a college expert. So um, a lot of advisors, quite frankly, just ignore this topic. 
uh, and the common answer that 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 we hear when I say, you know, what's your current advisor's plan to pay for all four years of college down to the penny, is that you know they don't really do that. Um, so you know, a lot of times in pretty short order, those become clients of ours because that is the number one financial concern. So I'm going to go through a couple of high level things, macro perspective, uh, break that back down of the, of the all the different pieces of the puzzle, and then break that down to the family level. Go through a little bit of financial aid, uh, both need based and merit. And then come back with some examples uh, to show you uh, just really areas where I feel like if advisors knew more and had more deeper knowledge, uh, they could really make a bigger impact in their community and really can't end the student loan crisis. Um, so, so thing number one is understanding who who we are serving. You know, so our clientele, uh, we probably have one of the younger clientels out there, uh, but we serve Gen X. You know, right now that's uh, parents that are uh, between the ages of roughly 38 and 53. So, you know, late 30s to early 50s. Uh, that's who we serve. Uh, we know from studies that Gen X uh, will be, it, it, it is the most affluent group of consumers we've ever had. Um, a lot of dual income households um, and, and highly educated folks, education has become more and more important, obviously. So what we also know is for those folks, as Katie mentioned, their number one uh, concern is, financial concern is how do we, how do we pay for college? So we can all run the proposals to help them and show them, you know, here's here's exactly, uh, you know, what you need to save. So you tell a, you know, the the 28 uh, year old that just had their first child that they need to save seven hundred and thirty eight dollars per month to pay for a private education for their student. And they're going to say, that's great. We have one hundred. So, you know, uh, we have one hundred dollars a month left. So what we're really focused on is who are we serving? And it's really those that are in high school. So National Center for Education Statistics. There's about 16 million kids in high school today. Roughly three to four million graduate every year. So that's also another three to four million that become freshmen every year. And that's another three to four million parents every year that are uh, concerned with how do we pay for college. What we also know is that 68.4% in 2016 enrolled directly in college. Now that's all colleges, but it's 68.4%. You know, if we went back 30 years ago, that number was reversed. It was about a third of kids were going into college and and, and the rest were not. But now uh, the demand is there and we know that college education is and a good education is is the clearest path to having, you know, a fulfilled life. And that's what our parents, you know, the, of our kids that we work with, that's what they're interested in. They're interested in ideal outcomes for their young adults. Right. So that's where the college comes in. Um, the other piece of the puzzle, you know, when we look at um, serving Gen X is the opportunity that exists there and how underserved they are. The vast majority of advisors would still tell you that they're focused on a liquidity event for a baby boomer. Well, I'm here to tell you that if we look at where the future is going, um, I just heard TD put out, TD Ameritrade put out a, a study the other day that they, they surveyed thousands of their advisors and uh, the vast majority of them understood that five years from now, uh, their core client is gonna be Gen X. So we're saying we already served Gen X uh, because, and here's why, this is a study by Deloitte and it just shows that if we look at what's going to happen with the transition of wealth, uh, the, the expectations are that over the next 15 years, the assets of Gen X will quintuple, you know, while baby boomers are leveling off. So this is really where the growth will be as far as assets. Uh, as they have their liquidity events, uh, they begin to inherit dollars, those types of things. These, there's going to be a lot of money in motion for Gen X over the next five, 10 years. So the other piece I would say is, if, you know, saving for college is important, all these pieces of the puzzle. But a lot of advisors are also in a position where they see they're, they're, they're trying to figure out um, how do we retain assets uh, because maybe they have an older demographic. Um, and what we know is from the statistics is that 70 percent of the dollars leave when the first spouse dies. So when when grandpa passes away, 70 percent of those assets that go on to grandma go to another advisor. When the second parent passes away, 95 percent of the assets leave a firm. And the reason is they're going to firms like ours that are serving a younger generation typically. So from an asset retention strategy, folding in college planning can be an extremely critical way uh, to not only grow your practice and get new clients, but also expand the relationship you have with maybe your larger clients that are in their 60s, 70s, and 80s even to serve their kids college bound students and do it do it the right way. So just bring that up. There's a huge opportunity to serve these folks and, and it's uh, dramatically underserved because uh, most advisors aren't trained on this uh, on this topic. So shifting gears a little bit, um, if you haven't heard, college is expensive. So I was just looking at some numbers the other day. Um, 
I, uh, I graduated from, uh, from Penn State University in 2000. So from 2000 to today, uh, it's uh, about two and a half times what it was uh, when, I, when I graduated. So this is showing what costs are uh, as of today. This is a study done by the collegeboard.org. Uh, so it's showing that uh, as of last year, um, a four-year in-state school, an all-in cost, that's tuition, room, board, fees, the whole shoot and match is 25,000. And for a four-year private, the all-in cost was around 50000 Now, if I add another column off to the right, uh, we're talking about the elite privates. Most of those will be over 70000 many of them over 75000 going into 2019 uh, for our next graduating class that we're looking at. So um, the numbers can be staggering. Um, and I point out on this chart, and, and I, oftentimes I'll say, if you have a kindergartner today, uh, if the costs do what they've done over the last 20, 30 years, uh, the cost will double. So it won't be 25, it'll be 50,000. People say, was well, that really possible? And I would, I would say, you know, uh, if, if it, it happened in, in my time, so from the time I graduated, it's gone from 10,000 to about 28,000 at Penn State for an in-state student. Uh, so absolutely it can happen. Um, but uh, if, if we look at the privates, obviously 50 to 100 and on down the line. The key thing, uh, one, one good news uh, here is that there is some leveling uh, of what's going on with uh, college costs. A lot of them have been put under pressure uh, to contain some costs and not raise quite as much. So we're seeing more of a two, three, 4% increase as opposed to you know six, seven, eight percent increases, which uh, we had seen in the past. So um, another question I get from a big picture is, you know, doesn't this have to stop at some point? These college costs are out of control. And I always reference um, the, there's a Gordon Gee was the president of Ohio State University, one of the largest institutions in the country, in the world, obviously, on, honestly. And uh, they commissioned a huge study. And at the end of that study from the state and all the board of governors, they said, you know, you know, why, why have you continued to raise your prices over the years? He said, quite frankly, because we can. Right. They can. There's demand for a product. So our, our really good institutions, our elite privates and our, our, our good state schools, there's so much competition to get in there. Um, and uh, it, it's just, there's a ton of competition. There's a lot of schools in the middle though, uh, that are really competing for great students to come there. So our small private colleges, they're struggling to get students in those seats because a lot of the kids are either going to elite privates or the state schools. But what has happened is when we look at this private school, $50,000, that's a big number, twice as much. The average discount on tuition is 49.9%. So how do we know where to find those schools that are gonna discount their tuition uh, half. So what we focus on is don't worry about sticker price, worry about what the, what the out-of-pocket cost is. So, and I'll go through some examples of that as we keep going, of how to find schools that are gonna give you discounts, and that's the key. Um, <clears throat> if you haven't heard, um, student loans are a problem in the United States, and we need to stop burying our heads in the sand. Um, because it is getting scary. So we just um, we just had a big day here in American history. We crossed, crossed the $1.5 trillion mark in student loans. <sighs> Everybody's super excited about that. Um, to put that in perspective, we started issuing loans back in 1965. Uh, 1965 to 2005, we had issued about 500 uh, billion. Now we're up to 1.5 trillion uh, short 12, 13 years later. Um, so you know the numbers are going crazy. Uh, 15 years ago, we were only at 250 billion. So 15 years, we've added 1.25 trillion. Uh, last year was the first year. The estimate is we added over 100 billion dollars to our national student loan debt. On average, 2,666 dollars per second, according to this, uh, you know, this clock. Um, so if we spend an hour together, that's 10 million dollars we add to our national student loan debt. So it's crazy. Um, things are out of control. And the concern is that, you know, as costs have continued to go up for college, we've actually had wage stagnation for about 10 years. So the cost of school has come up, but the, the return on that investment isn't really there uh, to the extent because our wages have stayed pretty much flat uh, coming out of school uh, for about for about 10 years, uh, inflation adjusted. So, so yes, it's a big problem at a macro level, but as personal financial planners, what we do is we go out and we work with families. So where is this really, where's the rubber hitting the road? Um, 2016 grad class, when they look at the study here, what they have found, um, uh, the student loan crisis and what it's causing in the country uh, at a high level is it's, it's stunting life. So people aren't getting married, people aren't buying homes, people aren't saving for retirement, they're certainly not saving for their own kids' college education. 
So that's what's happening. So this is a, at a macro level, and it's even getting, you know, it's getting uh, the attention uh, of of the of the Fed. You know, it, so they're really looking at this as is this a major macro problem? If we've got everybody with significant student loan debt, and the answer is yes. Uh, if everybody's uh, starting behind the eight ball. So um, what we know is for the average student, it's just part of the equation, though. Seven out of ten of our graduates are graduating with some type of some form of student loan. On average, they're at, they're coming out with about thirty-seven thousand uh, dollars in student loans. So to put that in perspective, the 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 the, the benchmark I always t say to look at from a rule of thumb uh, is for every ten thousand dollars you take out in student loans, you're going to owe roughly a hundred dollars back per month on the standard ten-year repayment schedule. So for every ten thousand we take out, we're going to owe roughly a hundred dollars back per month on the ten-year repayment schedule. So if we come out with thirty-seven thousand. Uh, we're going to have a $370 a month payment, roughly, um, just roughly. So it's a good just kind of rule of thumb to understand. So so we've got, uh, you know, a lot going on with the, the student loan crisis. The reality is it is part of the equation, but how do we help families make smart decisions and not get overburdened with student loan debt? How do we help them understand how to pay for all four years down to the penny, uh, including the student loans and what they may need to take? So uh, I guess I would I would... I would ask you this, uh, many of you on the call have probably taken out a mortgage or at least help your clients take one out. And if you think of when you take out a mortgage, think about um, what that process looks like, right? Take out a mortgage, you're gonna go in, the first thing that any good realtor is gonna tell you to do is go get a mortgage pre-approval letter from your bank. They're gonna ask you, you know, how much do you make? What's your credit history? What's your down payment? You know, everything about your financials and what that bank is trying to determine is what's the maximum amount of loan we can give you that we think you can reasonably repay, right? What's the maximum loan we can give you that we think you can repay? Um, so with that mortgage process, you know, if I go in and ask for a loan on this on this home here, which happens to be LeBron James house outside of Akron, uh, guess what? I'm gonna get denied for that loan. And the reason is because I don't have LeBron's resources. I don't have his income, I don't have his assets or his talent, quite frankly. Um, but, you know, the point is with college, the trouble is there really isn't a process to help people understand all four years. Everything typically is looked at in a one-year format. Here's your financial aid for one year. Here's what this, you know, it looks like. So we need to begin to look at this differently and help people understand um, how to shop for college. And one of the things that we would suggest is the way we shop for college is actually all wrong. If we follow our three-step process, most people actually start with step number three, all the way off to the right. They go shopping for schools. It's one of the only things that I know that people shop for before they create a budget and understand what they might be able to afford. So when I go shopping for schools, I live in Columbus, Ohio. Um, a lot of a lot of folks go down to drive down to Florida or the Carolinas for spring break and things. And on those drives, they hit schools like Vanderbilt and Duke and University of North Carolina, Clemson, all beautiful schools, uh, only to find out, you know, they let their students walk on those campuses, which is fine. But everybody that works at those schools is really good at their job. They're really good at admissions and helping them. They are the best salespeople for those for those schools. Um, and they will convince those students that it's worth whatever it takes to go there. And there are banks that will gladly give them the loans to attend. So it's a scary proposition. Um, so <clears throat> understanding, you know, if we can understand, if we can start with, this is a novel concept, but with college, let's create a budget first. And let's figure out what we actually have. Let's get honest with ourselves. Let's take our heads out of the sand and let's really figure out what we have. And I'm gonna show you our one page college funding plan that really helps us put all this together. It's a resource and a tool uh, that we'll certainly make available to everybody. So figuring out that budget, I'll go through step-by-step step on the next page, uh, how we kind of do that and tally that up. Um, number two is establish a maximum student loan amount. Establish a maximum student loan amount. Just when we talk about a mortgage pre-approval, what's the total amount of student loans you're gonna to have to take over four years and what's the payment? So we would suggest that your total loans for the whole cost of education should never be more than you think you're gonna come out uh, with your starting salary in that major. So you should never take out more loans than you think you're gonna make your first year out uh, with, with that major. So a maximum student loan. The reason is any higher than that, the numbers just don't work. So and I'll show you kind of what I mean uh, as we go forward with some examples. So determine your budget, get your resources, what's the maximum student loan, and then we go shopping. Uh, that's one, two, three. So 
Um, Cause what we know with student loans is that not all majors are created equal, right? So when we look at this, you know, I could go to the same school, same four years, pay the exact same room, board, tuition, fees, everything, exact same cost as my roommate. My roommate comes out with a computer science degree. I come out with an education degree. Right out of the chute, they make 100% more than me, twice my income. And their lifetime earnings is probably three to four times. I'm not saying don't go into education. I'm not saying don't go into any of these majors. But what I am suggesting is that before we commit to these majors, understand that the, 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 the income shovel of someone with a, that particular type of degree is much greater. So the investment in that education, therefore the return on that investment that we understand of advisors is greater. So I'm not anti-loan, I'm just anti too big of loan. And that's how we need to be able to begin to think of this. Does every kid that's 18 know exactly what they're gonna be when they grow up? Absolutely not. Will things change? Yes. But if we can get them into some ranges, you know, the kid that's on path to be a doctor probably isn't going to fall back and do, you know, something that's uh, minimal income. So, but, uh, and the idea is, so we'll give you some good ideas hopefully going forward, but understanding that, that the investment in education for families today is too much not to have, at least have an idea of what you think you might want to do. Uh, and if you don't have any idea, don't go to a school that's exorbitantly priced. You know, you can figure that out at a, at a community college or somewhere else. And I hear that a lot. What about community college and trade school? The reality is if you work with um, uh, you know, good families, make good incomes, they envision a four-year traditional college experience. So this is where they see their kids going. Um, so we just, you know, we just embrace that and know that that's what they're, they're looking for. So how do we create the budget? This is a tool, it's a simple tool. Um, one page college funding plan. So how do we create this budget? What we use this for is, is multi-prong, but this is kind of the cornerstone of what we do when we start with folks is, um, before you go and look at what the formulas think you can afford, let's figure out what you can afford. Because uh, the formulas are gonna come back and tell you what they think you can afford. And I can tell you, nobody's ever said, based on the formulas, uh, that, 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 that they can afford that. So not one time has that happened with hundreds of families. So we use this as a tool. Number one is to facilitate a conversation between mom and dad. We've got to get mom and dad on the same page, what we have saved for this student for college. And that's not an easy, as easy conversation as, as it sounds like. A lot of times mom and dad come from different backgrounds from a, from a college funding standpoint. You know, maybe, maybe uh, you know, mom went to, went to school uh, and it was 100% paid for and she came out with no student loans and mom and dad took care of it. Whereas dad, on the other hand, uh, w went part-time and worked part-time, uh, had to scratch and claw and do it over six, seven years, but he did it. Uh, and had to take out some student loans. So those perspectives are very different. So bringing mom and dad together, it's 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 shocking to me uh, that the parents, you know, very rarely have they really dug in and had this honest conversation. Um, but the reality is they need to have it now because they're going to get a bill for twenty-five to seventy-five thousand dollars for four years they've never had before. So we need to help them figure out how to pay for it. So this is just a tool to facilitate that conversation. Um, there's a full download on this, uh, the new approach to college funding. Uh, th this really kind of walks through uh, all this works. But um, the pieces of the puzzle, basically we look at what are parent resources, student resources, uh, parent loans, student loans, and is there outside help, right? So with parent resources, a couple of things I point out, 529 savings is a predominant tool, obviously, that's in there. So, but they've got what they've got. So what they're thinking is, I'm looking at schools that cost 160000 I've only got 25,000 by 529, what else do we do? And I say, okay, relax, take a breath. There are ways that normal families are paying for college each and every day. And let's walk through what the, how they do that. Bring their shoulders down. The idea with this is, is to reduce stress and anxiety over the college funding process, not uh, induce. Reduce, not induce stress and anxiety, and that's what this will do. It'll help bridge the gap so they understand you know, don't feel terrible that you haven't saved enough. Nobody has, uh, very rarely. 25,000 is a heck of a balance actually in a 529, especially if you've got multiple kids. So let's look at this. So what other assets might we use, be it stock uh, or a mutual fund that's earmarked for college for this student? And then cash flow. Cash flow is a huge one. You know, when we're working with families that are at this phase, they're usually in their peak earning years. They're in their late 40s oftentimes. So you know, their peak earning years means that hopefully they've been able to pay off some of their own debts and they're in a better position. So cash flow is good now, but they just didn't have the ability to save that because they were paying off their own student loans and had other debts. 
but now cash flow is good. So working with them to figure out how much can we pay per month towards the cost of college is a huge way to that most families pay for school. So a um, couple things I bring up, if they're already funding a 529 college savings plan, for example, to the tune of $200 a month, well, let's plan on continuing that. You're already used to it. The other thing I say is, you know, um, they're not free while they live at home. So the average cost of a meal plan at a school across the country is right around $2,500. So they're assuming that about $200 per month is what uh, it takes to, to feed that the young adult now. Um, so that alone is $400 per month. So, and that's about $20,000. $400 doesn't sound like much, but over 48 months, it's close to $20,000. Everything's always times 48 when we talk about months for college. So um, it's a powerful way just to help bridge that gap um, for folks. And then the other one, help them understand, do they qualify for the opportunity tax credit? You know, that's up to up to $2,500 per year that they could be eligible for uh, in, in tax credits. Uh, so beyond the scope of today going into that, but hopefully you know what that is, but it's something that they're not aware of. So just making them aware that, you know, this is a, a resource that's out there you may qualify for. Let's make sure you do. Um, so that's really helpful from an advisor standpoint. You know, let's talk about cash flow and opportunity tax credit. Two simple things for us to talk about, but they're not thinking about it. So if we can bring that to the forefront, it's just really easy, you know, pieces to talk about. Um, next one I'll get into, we'll come back to parent loans, but student resources, another important conversation to have with mom and dad before we even bring the student in. Do you expect your student to work while they're in college? And if they do, is that just for walking around money or is that for uh, actually paying for tuition? It's an important distinction, right? So, because we talk about, um, you know, what if we just said $200 per month they could contribute, be that through a work study uh, or maybe working over the summers. $200 a month, it's close to $10,000 that would come up to over the four years. So that's $10,000 less they don't have to take in student loans, right? It's 10,000 less. So I don't know about you, but when I was 22 years old, $100 less month per month actually meant something, right? If I didn't have those kind of expenses. Um, so, so that's an important piece. Uh, and then the last one down here before I get into loans, uh, identify grandparent help or out, other outside family help. I can't stress that enough, um, that how important that is. Because uh, grandparent money flowing into the financial aid system incorrectly, if you're a need-based financial aid candidate, can disrupt your next year's financial aid by up to 50%. So if we're not coordinating those strategies, I call it tri-generational planning. Uh, in our course, there's about an hour and a half on tri-generational planning and tax strategy to make sure that we're make, getting all that right, getting the most out of the financial aid system and the most out of the tax system. So, um, so I, I just put that there. You have to quantify where that is, what that is, and where that is. Some of you may be working with the grandparent, uh, and they may have saved in a 529 plan, but understand there are things you need to consider about where that, how that money uh, gets to the college ultimately. Uh, but uh, um, let's quantify it, and let's see, is it in an UPMA or a 529? So getting that on the table. Uh, last piece on here, you know, if we look at this, is, is student loans and parent loans. So parent loans, I'll start there. Um, we always start with zero. I don't want parents taking out student loans uh, for, for their children's education. Do some of them need to do it to bridge a small gap? Absolutely. But from the start, we want to see, can we, you know, let's find schools that we don't need to do that. So that's no, number one on parent loans. Um, and uh, so, you know, I won't even get into, you know, the, the parent loan that's out there, the predominant tool the, that's out there is a parent plus loan. And the parent plus loan is way too easy to get. Uh, it's a click of a button. It's usually approved in 48 hours. It's almost criminal how easy it is to get. And it's just a Band-Aid. Um, the origination fee on it is nearly 5% now. New rates actually go into effect next week. Uh, and the new rate for next year is right around 7.6%. So parent loans, parent plus loans in particular, they're extremely expensive, but they're an extremely easy way to make the problem go away temporarily. Um, so again, understand how do we pay for all four years down to the penny. With uh, student loans, like I said, for most folks, they're just part of the equation. Our goal with clients is to have students graduate with no more than $27,000 in student loans. So where does that number come from? It's not out of thin air. Uh, that's the maximum amount you can get through the federal direct Stafford program. Uh, that's all in the student's name, no cosigner required, et cetera. So that's that's actually, you know, that that's our goal uh, is to have no more than 27,000. Doesn't mean you have to take it all, but no more than that. And then we also say, you know, Absolutely, whatever school we're looking at, we're not going to take out any more than 36,000 if you're looking to be an educator. 
because our job and our goal is to have an ideal outcome for you as a 22, 23 year old. Um, that's the goal of doing, of paying for college and going to college. So that's a little bit, you know, on this piece. So we would say, okay, so now let's go shopping for schools and let's understand what the our for affordability is. We want to find schools that are, are less than $98,000 over four years. So that, that uh, process allows us then on the back end to see into the future because we can say before we commit to this school, I want us to understand how do we pay for all four years down to the penny. So we take that budget and we apply that. And what we usually say is this, this is a net cost to attend. One of our goals and with the tools we have, you can you can ask, I can I can get to what a family's out of pocket cost with about 95% accuracy long before they even apply to the school. You know, we have a very good idea of what they're gonna actually pay long before they apply. And that's a powerful thing. Helps them be an informed consumer as they go shopping, and I'll come back to some examples on that towards the end. But at the end of the day, you know, we apply the, you know, we apply the cash flow we talked about. Do they qualify for the tax credit? 529s, is it a better idea to front load it or pay it on the back end? You know, the temptation sometimes is use that all in year one and pay for school, where a, a, a better strategy is to understand if we need loans, how do we take those? Because one of the things I point out, like with the with the uh, the Stafford loan program, the direct loans for the student, they're use it or lose it each year. So each year you have a certain amount allotted. So freshman year, they give you 5,500, sophomore year, 6,500, junior year, 7,500, uh, senior year, 7,500. That's something that a lot of advisors may not be aware of, but from a planning perspective, let's say the school only costed 25,000, the temptation would be, well, we'll just use the 529 and use that balance, and then we'll deal with the rest later. Where a much better strategy would be, let's take out some of those favorable student loans, good rates, all in the student's name, uh, and, and, and we'll save some of that 529 for later so that we don't have to take out private loans or parent loans. So understand, it's just putting together a smart lending strategy is really important in this too. So um, I use this hopefully just to point out, you know, that the, those loans, the way those flow across. Um, and then in this case, what we always want to figure out, you know, if you have a funding gap, how are we going to do that? Right now, you've got over 72,000 that's above what you budgeted for your loan. So your total loan amount is going to be close to $100,000. You're 23, you're just starting your career. Mom and dad, are you okay with your, uh, with your uh, son having an $1,100 a month payment to start their career in their life? That's what we're trying to avoid, right? Or at least help them understand the choice that they're making. If they choose to make it, we can't always... Uh, make them not make that. So the only solution that we've seen offered up really from from uh, any of the government is more income-based repayment plans that allow you to stretch your payment over 20, 25, even 30 years. So who does that really help? You know, in the long run, we're financial folks on this call. Um, yes, it cuts your payment in half, which is great. It's temporary relief. But instead of being done with loans when you're 32, you're in debt until you're 45, 50, 55 years old. And you're going to pay three times as much in the life of the loan payment, right? We know that as financial folks, but helping people understand three times as much interest and being in debt and having that payment for that long. Let's focus on 10 year repayment. Let's get kids done, you know, young adults done in their early 30s and let them get on with their lives. This doesn't shouldn't be servitude for the rest of our lives. So, you know, that's the key here. Uh, hopefully getting in, we take that one page plan, we apply it, we look down the, down the path. Um, so hopefully that's helpful because um, we're going to shift gears a little bit. Um, so we're going to get into the business of college and how it actually works and kind of some, I'm going to keep this treetop because we, you know, we've got about 15, 20 more minutes, but these are the pieces of the puzzle that I think if every financial advisor knew more, had more knowledge uh, and had more confidence in giving good advice in some of these areas, we could really change things. You know, we can really go out and affect this student loan crisis if we all had uh, better knowledge in these areas. So on the left, um, we've got, you know, the three main factors that influence where we're going to go to school. Um, is it an academic fit? So do they have the major that leads to the career that I would like to get? That's a big reason people um, uh, transfer, right? Social, is it a good social fit? Uh, do I enjoy the campus? You know, I like small classes, so I probably shouldn't go to Penn State where my first freshman class had over 1,100 kids in it, intro bio, right? So if you're somebody who needs a smaller environment, it's probably not a good fit. So that's a reason people transfer. Financials, the number one reason people transfer uh, is financials, right? So that's one piece we understand. So one thing I want to impress upon you is that the number one way to make college more expensive is to go a fifth year and a sixth year, right? We can add 25% cost just by doing that. So 
finding schools where we can graduate in four years manageable student loan debt without robbing retirement is the goal is the goal here so how do we do that i think it's important that we understand that college is a business and we shouldn't overpay for it so college what the way i think of it uh, the you know if we think of this as a funnel their job there's an enrollment manager at schools and their job is to go out and put together a rock star freshman class the best possible student body they can highest academic profiles a diverse mix all these pieces of puzzle these perimeters are looking at and their job is to get that great freshman class to come in and have them pay as much as possible i'll say that again get the best possible class in and have that consumer pay as much as possible right so our job as the consumer is to flip that on its head we want to go find the best possible school best value for us and our family and pay as little as possible right so the key is is how do we do that how do we shop you know and this is where it gets into how can we help families make informed decisions around college so uh, a couple pieces of the puzzle so i get excited about this stuff so if i talk too fast i think there's a replay that'll go out but you gotta understand this is stuff that i do every day and i get fired up when i get an opportunity to present to advisors because if you can understand some of these pieces of the puzzle man you can make a huge difference for your clients um so I say top 25%, that's where the money is. The reason I say that is if you think of yourself when I talk about the schools, what they're doing, they're going to incentivize and give, you're going to have the highest probability of getting the most money from schools where your student is in the top 25% academically, right? So putting yourself in their shoes, top 25%, of course, those are probably the ones that are going to get the discount. If you're in the bottom 25%, they may accept you but do they need to incentivize you to come if you were on the border of getting in? Probably not. They're going to incentivize those that they, they feel like they need to, right? So just that's not true of all schools, and I'll show you what I mean when we go through some scholarship stuff. But understand that's a key, a key thing, particularly for our families who don't qualify for need-based aid. Uh, so on the right, these are other shopping things we want to look at. What's your graduation rate? So the reality is uh, less than half of our kids are getting done in four years at, at public schools and it isn't much better at privates. So six and 10 are getting done in six years. You know, a lot of that has to do with running out of money and transferring and not having clarity on what you wanna do. So uh, just understand if we can put some of that work in up front. Um, and I will say that, you know, folks that help with the degree and the major and the uh, academic fit, uh, those people refer me all the business we ever need in our practice. You know, cause th those are folks, other financial advisors aren't talking to them. So we go out, and one of the things we coach in our programs is, you know, instead of talking to CPAs and estate planning attorneys, go talk to the ACT prep person uh, that's never talked to a financial planner before. Go talk to somebody who does career counseling for high school kids. Um, and, and that's that's where that's our strategic partnerships in our firm uh, is working with those folks. Um, so the degree and the major, we talked about it. What's the value? How do they help you after graduation is huge. Do they get you the jobs? And then financial aid, obviously, is what we'll spend the rest of the time on as we go through. A couple of really good resource sites, if this is newer stuff to you, obviously, savingforcollege.com, but also collegeboard.org and collegedata.com have a lot of information drilling into some of the pieces I'm going to talk about today. So kind of self-help resources. I think what we'll be able to illuminate is what these numbers actually mean, because uh, any tool is only as good as uh, knowing how to use it. Um, before I roll, um, so really, uh, next piece is just going into uh, financial aid. So how does it work? What are the main parts? So financial aid comes really in, in two different forms. It comes in the form of merit-based aid uh, and, and need-based aid. So merit is exactly what it sounds like. Um, you know, you apply and you get it based on the merit of that student, a unique talent or skill or performance. So the thing about merit-based aid is it's always gift aid, which is a scholarship uh, that's money you don't have to pay back or work for. Need-based aid is, is much more complicated, and then there's more pieces of the puzzle um, in some cases. So the main reason is it does come in the form of gift aid, which is grants and scholarships, uh, but it also comes in the form of what is affectionately called self-help. So that's student loans and work study. Uh, and if you had to guess which is the largest program that we have out there for need-based, yes, it is student loans. Uh, important part of the puzzle for a lot of families, but uh, just understand that that is not free money. It's money we got to pay back. So, so let's see here. Uh, the the key is uh, that we use we teach we coach around a, a quadrant system. 
So you need to understand what is your opportunity and what type of family are you and understand that now so that then we can go shop for college because depending on where you sit, the way you shop for college is completely different. So what I mean by that is, so on from top to bottom, you know, if, if you are you high merit or low merit? So you have a really talented student or not, maybe you didn't do great on tests. And then are you low need, meaning you won't qualify for much if any financial need or are you high need? High need meaning that financially, uh, you're going to qualify for a lot of need-based financial aid. So, the, the and I'll show you some solid examples because school people on the right, you're going to look for schools that meet at or near whatever you need. And people on the on the top left, which is what we see, we've got a lot of high-income families that have really talented students, and they're not going to get any need-based aid. That's really a lot of what we coach around because we're serving mass affluent clients most of the time. Um, so we focus differently with them. We're looking for where do you find true scholarship money that doesn't care about uh, our need, uh, how can test prep impact things, and how do we tax plan to make this uh, correct? So, so that's the quadrant system. You know, we hear stories all the time, and we think people get a little bit confused because uh, they say, "Well, I heard so and so got a full ride, you know, at Harvard." I can tell you, well, that, that's great. You, you're going to pay full price there. I can tell you that because they don't have scholarships at Harvard. They only have need-based aid. That's a tough pill for a lot of people to swallow, but I can you can tell them that early instead of waiting until they've got that college-bound uh, person that gets in. So, so need-based aid at a high level. Spend a few minutes on this. I'm not going to dig into the details of the formulas today. I'm just going to keep it high level, uh, but I will talk about some differences and some nuances that I think advisors need to be aware of. So, uh, need-based aid. The the basic equation is very simple. They're going to look at the total cost of attendance minus what's called your expected family contribution. EFC. So essentially EFC is the minimum amount that the formula thinks you should be able to afford this year towards the cost of college. So cost of attendance minus EFC equals your financial aid need. So the basic formula would say if a school costs 50000 and you had an EFC of 20, you'd be eligible for $30,000 of need-based aid at that institution. School costs 50, EFC of 20, you're going to be eligible for $30,000 in need-based aid at that institution. So next line there, same family, but if the school only costs $20,000, your EFC is the same 20, you'd qualify for $0 of need-based aid at that institution. So a couple of things I'll point out here is just because you are eligible for $30,000 of need-based aid does not mean the school has $30,000 to give you. Some schools will meet 100%, so all $30,000. Other schools will meet 15, 50%, so only 15000 so if they only meet 50%, the rest is still on you. That's going to be out of pocket. So just understand, just because you qualify doesn't mean the school has it. All endowments are not created equal. That's the way I think of that. Um, another key part with EFC and the planning is uh, understand its expected family contribution. So roughly, most schools, um, when you have one in, it was 20. But if you have overlapping students or twins, it's not 20,000 each. It's just 10,000 each. So your need-based eligibility actually goes up when you have multiple kids in school. So we've probably seen more triplets and doubles in this office than any other financial planner in the country because they're freaking out about college, but we're able to put them at ease and help them plan and understand that, you know, you, you're, you're probably going to qualify for a pretty good need-based financial aid, uh, more than likely. So uh, just good, to, good, good things to know as we're going into this. So um, EFC, you can go get an EFC today. So you can do that on savingforcollege.com. They've actually got one uh, for folks that are in their uh, in their paid membership. I believe it's it's required, but you know you've, you've, we've got one through SavingForCollege.com. Uh, but the public sites, College Board and College Data, are great. The other thing to know is that every school is now required to have a net price calculator on their website. So every college and university that takes any federal money has to have a net price calculator. That includes student loans. So basically, you go, you put in your information about your students' academics and your financials. And it will tell you if you were to come here last year, uh, this is the the net cost we think you would have cost. It would have cost you. So extremely powerful. You could go do those with with clients today. Um, you know these are these are free tools that you can do. Just work with them to to figure them out. So uh, the 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 formulas and the applications that drive this. So the FAFSA is the predominant formula. Um, it's the free application for federal student aid. Uh, it drives the federal formula, um, and essentially. Uh, what I wanted to cover is just that this is the vast majority of schools use this to determine your aid eligibility. The timeline on this has shifted a little bit in the last couple of years, but essentially if you're if you have a, a, a rising senior right now, you're going to be a senior. 
uh, you're going to be going off to the school in the fall. You're going to be off to school, going off to school next fall. Right around the corner, you're going to be filling out your application for admissions. What we would suggest is that you have your applications all in for admissions by no later than November 1st. Well, why is that? Um, a lot of schools have deadlines that you you could you could apply to many schools till with through February or March, um, and they may even let you in. Um, but if you want to be considered for scholarship dollars, you have to have it in by a certain time. So, you know, if, if the deadline is November 1st and you apply November 3rd, they don't care if you're the valedictorian and you've got, you know, a 35 ACT. What they care about is that you didn't get in on time. So you got to make sure you know the deadlines for your schools to be considered for scholarship money. Um, I could tell story after story after that about that from people that call in after the deadlines. Um, so the FAFSA, the financial aid form, becomes available um, on, on October 1st now. Um, so if you've got a you know a senior in high school, October 1st will be the first one you fill out uh, for, for that family. Um, we recommend, again, just file it by November 1st. The good news now is they're using what they call the prior prior tax year. I know these are a lot of college funding focused people on, the, on this call. So the prior prior tax year, it's the spring of the sophomore year and the fall of the junior year is an easy way to explain that to a parent. Spring of the sophomore year, fall of the junior year, that's the year they're looking at to assess your need-based eligibility. So this freshman year, um, that year, like if, if we're looking at 2019, that's the year you want to look as poor as possible. It's called the base year. Your financial aid can shift around somewhat during the four years and things change. But that base year is the year you want to look as poor as possible because they base your four-year package on that. So just understand that. So income's going back. They do have the data retrieval tool now, which makes it much more simplistic to pull in your income numbers. Um, it goes out to the IRS site, pulls in that data, and, and it makes it much, much more uh, simplified for you, less errors. So assets, though, are the day you file. So assets are the day you file. Um, so when you actually pull that balance sheet with a client and you go and look and, and the day they click submit, that's that's what they're looking at from an asset standpoint. Um, I don't have time in this call to go through every little detail, but I did want to at least illuminate a couple of things and some differences to be aware of. The main thing is to understand that there are, there's uh, really two different formulas at play and another and another form at play, another application. So every school requires the FAFSA, but a lot of schools or, or some schools about I think about around 300 schools also require what's called the CSS profile. And these are going to be our most elite colleges that are out there. Um, they look much deeper. They use an institutional formula to determine what your financial aid need is. Um, there's a lot less known about the institutional formula than the federal because the federal publishes exactly how it works. The institutions have the latitude to really kind of do what they want. They use the same metrics, uh, but they really do. They can assess things and and figure out what they're what they think you're eligible for. Uh, so it's it is a, it's complicated, uh, but there are some commonalities that I'll show you. So the CSS profile being used at schools, and there's also what's called uh, the consensus methodology. And essentially, the consensus methodology it's it's another group of schools that come together and they said we're going to come to a consensus on the way we're going to look at financial aid. And a couple of things we said is uh, we're going to be need blind. So need blind is one piece that I think gets confused. It has nothing to do with financial aid. It has to do with admissions. So they're saying we're not going to assess you and we're not going to look at you and say just because we know you're going to have to, you can pay us full price, we'll let you in even though you don't academically qualify. Uh, does that happen still? Yes, but these schools have said that we're not going to operate that way. Is it always true? I would beg to differ, but uh, that that is what we're looking at, and they're going to make sure that if you have need-based aid, we are going to make sure that you get the money. We don't want money to be a barrier to come to our institution. So this is a list of those schools. It's some of the top ones out there. Uh, but if you look look up uh, 568 Presidents Group, you'll see them. Uh, obviously, they're very high priced, but they also have significant endowments. So if you can get into these schools, if you if you have financial need, they'll meet 100% of it at or near 100%. Understand that. Hey, Joe, um, can I interrupt you for one second? We do have a couple of questions that came through about financial aid. Uh, do sure. you want to take those now? Um, let me let me finish this slide. It might round some out. OK, um, just the, the differences, because um, this may answer some of those questions and then we'll, we'll have a, a logical pause. Sure. All right. So the, the thing I just want to point out, we don't have time to go through every nook and cranny of what they look at uh, in the forms. But I did want I do want folks to understand that um, the FAFSA and the, the the federal method, institutional method, and consensus, the way they look at different things is vastly different. 
Uh, just a couple examples. Um, the FAFSA does not look at non-qualified annuities, but the profile and consensus schools do. That's a big one. Home equity, the FAFSA does not look at it, but the profile schools and the consensus schools do in almost every case. Um, the FAFSA schools do not look, if, if you're a divorced family, they only look at the parent you live with the majority of the time, uh, whereas profile and consensus schools look at both. So you can see how that can create major swings. So with families, just having knowledge that, you know, all schools and all financial aid isn't created equal is the point I was going to make there because um, you, you need to understand as an advisor, how do we find schools that can give us discounts? Okay, so questions? Okay, so um, first we have a question. Can upper middle class and even upper class families qualify for any financial aid and or loans? Uh, yes, yes. So um, it depends on what, what, how we're defining that, but the, the, key, the key is can you qualify? Yes, it depends on obviously the price of the school and the EFC. That, that, that formula is pretty well determined. You know, Do you qualify for any need-based aid? Um, and, and from a loan standpoint, that federal direct loan, the, the subsidized portion you have to qualify for, that just means there's no interest in school. But the unsubsidized, even if you make $10 million a year, every student's offered that as long as you fill out the financial aid forms. So, and I think probably when we talk financial aid, we're going to get into more of the merit side as the next step. So. Okay. And uh, this question relates to a previous slide. Um, He's asking, considering 529s are considered student assets from a FAFSA perspective, is there any reason it's listed as a parent resource? Uh, that's incorrect. Uh, 529, if it's owned by the student or if it's owned by the parent, are actually considered a parent asset on the FAFSA form. So even if the student owns it, it's actually considered a parental asset. So you should make sure we, you uh, want to uh, put that in correct. Okay, great. Thanks. Yep. We good? Yep. Um, and whoever that is, if they want to contact me. I've got some uh, information on that because the profile and consensus schools, if the 529 is in the kid's name, they look at it differently. So it's kind of complicated. It's not as easy as I've made it sound. So scholarships uh, and a couple examples and we'll uh, wrap up. So the good news about scholarships, they paid for about a third of college last year, uh, but school cost 500 billion, but there was about 150 billion that went out. The point I try to make on this slide is that a um, couple things. One half of one percent of kids get any that played athletics in high school get a penny of athletic scholarship in college. So I say with uh, student athletes, if, if you know, hope is not a strategy. You know, it's very unlikely that that's going to be the case. The other point I make is if we look at private private scholarships, they're great. Apply early, apply often, have a game plan, get as much as you can, but understand they're a supplement. The big money is with the institutions themselves. Right, Harvard serves across its whole platform, I think 15,000 kids. They've got a $46 billion endowment, right? So understanding the schools have the big money, they're the ones where you're gonna get the most money first and supplement with private. So the key though is understanding is different schools look at scholarships very differently, particularly for families that are not need-based financial aid candidates. The person that asked about, can they qualify? Yes, but a lot of times if we can just take that hat off and focus on finding schools that are going to give us good discounts regardless, that's the, really the key for uh, higher income, mass affluent. I would say probably eight to nine out of 10 of our clients that work with us for our service, they're not financial aid need-based clients. So we focus a lot on these other strategies, finding schools that are going to give them scholarships. So the three ways that they do it, number one is competitive. So competitive schools, it's what it sounds like. You know, you got a thousand kids applying, we're gonna give away 10 full rides, presidential scholarships, extremely competitive, right? So that's a competitive school. Um, again, think of that top 25%. You know, if you're gonna get money from a competitive standpoint, are you in the top 25% of their incoming class? The other school that's interesting uh, are what we call package schools. I call them package schools because they package things up because they have to compete and they know it. So a package school, are a lot of our smaller private schools uh, around us. So all of our state, many of our states have those all around us. So these are schools that are fighting for kids. They're usually two, 3,000 kids. They may have a sticker price of 60,000. Nobody's paying that because they're giving you significant discounts to get you to come. So those kind of schools. And the third type that's interesting it would be a grid or an automatic school. Those basically run on a grid. So they say, if you do this, you'll get this. So, um, 
In this case, this is Alabama. For out-of-state students this past year, it's 2018-19, they're on a charge to really erase their academic profile, so they're willing to incentivize great students to come there. And they come there and they also put them in their honors college many times. So there's a lot of schools like this. This is just a good example of one to show you the value of test prep. So in this case, if you went from a 28 to a 29 on your ACT, that's $28,000. Talk about an incentive. That's a car, a nice car. Uh, you know, you go from a 29 to a 30, that can bump you up another 24,000 and another 24,000 and you get up to a 33. So I point these out because these are opportunities, regardless of your financial need, these are scholarships that exist for talented students. You need to know where to find them is the key. Here's the other part that we try to illuminate as we go through things. Um, the schools on the right, we've all heard of. Northwestern, Notre Dame, MIT, Harvard. All these schools are great schools, great institutions. Um, and if you have financial need, they will meet 100% of it. 100% of it if you have need. They do not want money to be a barrier to you coming there. However, uh, if you do not have any financial need, you will be a full pay client. You'll be a full pay client for them. Uh, that's just how they work. They don't have scholarships because what they would say is everybody that gets in here is a valedictorian and has a 35 ACT. How would we decide who gets a scholarship? So that's, how, that's just how they operate. So if you can help have that conversation with a, a sophomore in high school before they begin falling in love with certain schools and you can understand and help parents understand these things, a huge, huge way to make sure that you're not getting sucked in and getting bulldozed by kids when they when they get into Cornell, even though you can't afford it. Um, on the left, however, these are great schools that give great merit-based aid, regardless of your family circumstances. So we talked about Alabama, but other schools like Tulane and Case Western, Dennis Center, a couple small private schools here in my neighborhood that give great scholarships regardless. So a couple examples I like to give. One is for a small private, they call this a package school, but Denison's a great private school. Their sticker price is right around 65,000. If you go there, they're gonna say, if you have financial need, we're gonna be 90% of this. Our average first year student got $40,000 off almost, first year financial aid. I said, great, I don't have any financial need. What does that mean for me? Our average non-need based aid that students got was over 23,000. So that's a pretty good number. So it's a really good discount. Right. Even if you don't have financial need, their average student that didn't have need, many of them got this. And those usually go to the top 25 percent. Right. So those are the students that get it. So uh, another example on the other side of the coin, you go to visit Yale. They're going to say we meet 100 percent of need. If you have need, we'll meet 100 percent. Our average student received a package of over 52,000 per year. Wait a second. I'm not a need based candidate. My EFC is seventy five thousand dollars. What kind of scholarships is there? If I don't have any. It's, it's a nice round number. It's zero. Right. So that's the that's the one there. Um, so understand you can empower people by knowing how to shop. And that's kind of one of the things that we really illuminate as we go through our coursework. Um, two examples and, and uh, I'll, I'll go through kind of our offer for today and then we'll be out of here. So give me a couple extra minutes, hopefully. Um, here is a school, a family that has high need, understanding that the net cost is all that matters. The net cost is all that matters. Doesn't matter what the sticker price is. This family was only looking at state schools and some of the uh, community colleges around, and I encouraged them to look at some private schools because uh, I knew that they had a talented student that they would really want. Um, at the end of the day, the EFC is the same. They had a ton of need at the private school, $42,000, and they were able to meet 100% of it. They had a lot less need at this state school, but they were only able to meet about 50% of it. At the end of the day, this family ended up paying $10,000 per year for a state school that's uh, double the price on the on the sticker versus 17,000. So it's all about the net price, all about the net price. Last example is a high uh, high EFC, a no need family. They were looking at uh, Matt, uh, MIT and they were looking at Case Western. Uh, EFC 75,000, MIT, they're a full pay client. Case Western gave them a $20,000 a year scholarship. That's just how they work with their financial aid. Where the plot thickens is with Case Western, we were able to leverage some other offers from other schools that we encourage them to apply to that are like schools that compete for that student. By leverage, I mean we appeal for additional aid because we have better offers uh, in about 72 hours with some eloquently written letters and phone calls from the parents and the student. We got another 5,000 per year. Uh, so went from 80,000 to 100,000. So the net cost goes down. So 
that's kind of it that I had to run through today. It goes back to making smart choices. Um, and again, as advisors, what we focus on is um, join the movement. You know, either be the expert, become the expert. If you want to grow a business around this, you can. Um, have an expert on your team. If you're an experienced advisor and you've got a junior or you are a junior, propose this to someone in your office that maybe is the principal that, hey, I really think we can make a, a go at this and have this be a great part of our practice. That's been a great way for young folks to really fold in, add clients and add value or outsource to an expert. So those are all areas that we try and, you know, if you really want a resource and you want somebody to work with on a national level, um, come to us. But I wanted to point out what we really do at Capstone. Uh, college partners is we have online online advisor training to put advisors in the top 1% of college funding out there. Um, I went for about 50 minutes. I went pretty quick today, but the reality is with our programs, what we want to do is put you in a position uh, to one, become, know the mechanics of college funding, how to do it the right way. And then number two, if you want to take that next step is, is know how to market it and become the local expert. So, you know, our, our academy, um, just for the education component, uh, the mechanics, it's 17 videos, um, spreads to eight and a half hours of CFP CE. Um, you learn the college pre-approval system, obviously much more in depth on all the topics we went through. Um, there's seven downloadable guides that you get as part of that. You know, just some of the topics on student loans, tax planning is one of them. How does the FAFSA work in great detail? It's a 12 page document on how the FAFSA works. Um, having the college money talk with kids. These are all valuable guides that you get as part of that course. Um, for uh, it's usually a thousand dollars. It's basically 800. So 999 down to 799, or you can do it monthly if you would like. Those are all available. Uh, but we're we're offering 20% discount, uh, which I think is is pretty great. Um, excited to do it uh, for this community because I know it's people that are concerned with uh, the college costs. And for those folks that really want to go to the next level and they want to market college planning and build a business around it, uh, which is what we've done. Um, the online academy it really We've, I've really built it and we continue to grow it. It's got all the, uh, it's got five self-paced videos where we're going through a one-on-one, -on -one, how to do a group presentation, how to meet and build your centers of influence uh, in this in this area. Um, college pre-approval system, data gathering forms. And what people really like is that we don't leave you hanging like some systems do. They teach you how to do all this stuff, but then they're like, but I, I don't want to, how do I market this and how do I go out? So we give you white labeled PowerPoint slides and we give you, um, custom white label brochures so that you can go to market and feel confident. You can take this message of college pre-approval um, and, and take it to your market and uh, make sure that you're getting a uh, great, um, you know, you don't have to think about what you're doing. Uh, you're just going to go implement. So that's really the goal, you know, and bringing it all together. Um, there's some unique links that will be provided in emails afterwards, but that really is, you know, what we came up with is just a, an incentive because our goal is to spread our movement and mastering college pre-approval is the way we, we're aiming to do that by training advisors um, that can go out, impact their communities and really help, you know, end the student loan crisis one family at a time. So um, I'm sorry I went a little bit long, but I'm, I'm happy to stick around for questions. But I thank everybody for for hopping on. Um, and I know Katie will be in touch with kind of next steps if people are interested. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll hand it back to you. Sure, yeah. Um, as, as Joe mentioned, uh, shortly everyone will be receiving an email and that's going to have all of the details of the offer that he just spoke about as well as um, a link to get the CE credit from participating in this webinar. Um, and Joe, we had about three more questions if you wanted to take them real quick. Yeah, um, to. Sure. Um, the first is, have you heard of a tax scholarship? I have. Uh, we have a whole there. I think it's about an hour and a half of the courses tax scholarship and there's a whole resource guide around tax planning for college um, that I, obviously we had to update this year. So um, I didn't get into it today, but, you know, a couple of things that come to mind there. Um, one of the things when we say being in the top one percent, this is an anecdote. Um, I had an advisor that has been in the business a number of years. He said, you know, I thought that was kind of <laughs> um you know, one top one percent. He said, but then I went through your course, and then I met with a CPA that's been in business for 30 years, and I talked to him about how to implement a tuition reimbursement plan uh, for a small business owner for his for kids in college, and he had never heard of it. So we walk you through step by step how to do strategies like that. Okay. So that's um, using tax free money to pay tuition to to put it in a nutshell. <laughs> cool. Mm -hmm. um, someone else asked, I thought they take both parents 
when divorced into the formula for calculating need. Also, I thought some even take the account in the remarried divorced family stepfather or stepmothers. Yeah, so that's it's kind of what I was trying to point out um, in that uh, in the differences slide is that the way that the FAFSA looks at it is they only take the one. The custodial parent is the one who files it and they look at their income and assets. But at the profile schools that, that require the CSS profile, they do pull in both and many of them also pull in the remarried. So um, if if the if the if the parent the custodial parent that's found the forms is remarried, they are going to pull in that remarried spouse's information. Okay. Um, so you know, there's kind of a uh, different schools do it differently, I guess is the key. But FAFSA schools, uh, it's pretty cut and dry how they assess it. But the CSS profile schools, the vast majority look at both parents, uh, both the custodial and the non-custodial. Um, there's only I think two or three schools that don't look at both. Um, but but that's a, that's a great question because that's something we get questions on a lot. Um, you know, what are they looking at? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then two more questions related to the offer. Um, sure. Are the presentations FINRA approved? Uh, FINRA uh, hasn't been FINRA approved. It's been approved by many broker dealers. Okay. So. Um, and I forgot to mention, like any, we, I, I can't do this for everybody, but first 10 people to, if they want to buy it, um, I'm going to do a free 30 minute session with them. So, which we typically charge 300 bucks for. So first 10 folks that want to buy it, I just wanted to offer that up. Kind of forgot that we've made that part of this. So, yes. And that's in the email also. So, um, okay. and I would say, you know, the, the FINRA approval, um, a lot of the broker dealers, even if it is FINRA approved, you still got to go through broker dealer approval. So we've just kind of went that route. Uh, and help the advisors with it so okay so they'll just have to make sure with their own firm mm -hmm. um okay and then does does it all it says does this also cover graduate school applications graduate school applications um we 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 do go through graduate school um it, it, so so yes we go through it but it's not uh as in depth we do focus on uh the undergrad uh, but we do have a section that talks through um, the shift that happens from going from it from a dependent student to independent and kind of what the the loan opportunities are there but we don't really get into uh, from the application i don't know if they meant like um, admissions stuff that's not that's not us okay okay um one final question what are options for a student where the parent refuses to complete the fafsa uh it's that's a good question um so they can petition to say that they are uh, an independent student which is a is not easy um but there are times when that happens um so uh th there are ways to do it um so that they can say i'm independent i have no um, support um oftentimes that's going to require them quite frankly like not living with them um so um but I, my, my biggest thing uh, with that is typically to say work with the financial aid office at the institution and have them help guide you if, if, if that's the case, because there are ways that they can, can get that done. Okay. All right. Well, I think that wraps up the questions. Um, just so want to thank a, you again. I was going to say, it's, it's called emancipation. It's, it's a, that's the technical term it, the, to be an emancipated student, but it's complicated, but I would work with the school directly um, that you're, that you're working with. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much, Joe. Um, this was really informative, and I think um, you know the products will be a really good value for our audience. Um, and once again, everyone, just keep an eye out for those emails where you'll find the links to the offers. Um, and then, as Joe mentioned, the first ten will be eligible for the thirty-minute strategy session, which is a three hundred dollar value. So, um, yeah, keep an eye out for those emails. And thanks again, Joe. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody.